Happy New Year. Welcome to the first Sports World Have Your Say of 2012. We're back after a week of and raring to go. Hopefully you are as well. Coming up this week. Party poopers Sunderland spoil Manchester City's New Year celebrations. We miss uh, a big opportun opportunity today because uh, we had a big chance to go three points uh, up uh, to United. The party's not being great across Manchester. Some of you aren't happy with Sir Alex, but he's not pleased either. 2-2, uh, I thought we'd, we'd go and win it. The third goal was a killer for us. You know, it was a bad defensive error. We should have done better with that. There's red faces at Anfield. Where do Liverpool go from here after the report into the Suarez racism ruling? The hero returns. Thierry Henry is back at Arsenal. But who else do you want to see on the comeback trail? And was this a fond farewell from Didier Drogba on Saturday? The transfer window is open and it's got people talking. Yep, if all the messages on Facebook and Twitter this week are anything to go by, you've all been missing us while we've been away. Thank you very much. Keep all the tweets and posts coming into the usual addresses. Or why not pick up the phone? Give us a call. Plus 44 20 70 83 73 33. Mark Bright has stopped his New Year celebrations in time to join me in the studio. Go on make his trip worth it. We're here for the next hour and as we kick off 2012, we've got some familiar faces joining us again. Some of our biggest fans from the last five months are back with us. Welcome to Angela and Steve. We'll get the conversation started in just a couple of minutes, but first let's get a summary of the latest news. You're watching Sports World, have your say. Mark Bright is with me in the studio waiting to talk to you. Angela is with us as well, a Stoke fan who normally is based in Tenerife, but is back here in Stoke for the festive period. And Steve is uh, with us as well, a Chelsea fan from New York. It's uh, been one of those weekends that you look at the results and might well have thought that your TV and the video printer has been broken after defeats for Manchester United and Chelsea on Saturday. Odds of 337 to 1. Manchester City have gone and followed that up with defeat to Sunderland on Sunday. Odds of that as well. Can you believe 2,365 for 1? Please do uh, get in touch if you had a, had a little bet on that one. Uh, Mark, maybe this game isn't all about money after all. <laughs> it's always around the, the Christmas period or the New Year period. <clears throat> that football goes crazy. I mean, I can remember 20 years ago, you have to go back a long time, Amanda, when I think it was C Queen's Park Rangers beat Manchester United at Old Trafford, something like 4-1, and no one could believe it. I think Dennis Bailey scored a hat-trick. Um, and around this time of the year, there's always bizarre results. When I was playing uh, for Crystal Palace, we beat Ipswich 5-0 at home uh, on Boxing Day, and then we travelled and went to Ipswich the, the same night and played the next day, and they beat us 5-0. So uh, for, for most football people, they, they know around this time of the year that they, the results can all go upside down. Uh, Steve, too much festive fun at Chelsea, do you think? Um, I was thinking the same thing. Um, yeah, I think it shows that maybe they had a little too much partying over the holiday. But personally, I think that all those losses mean absolutely nothing. Um, you know, every now and then you get a string of the big teams losing like that. And then for the next few months, they're, you know, dominating the league just like they always do. Um, I, this happens, I think, in every sport. You know, you always get the bad teams coming up every so often, shocking the big teams. Um, I don't think that this trend is here to stay, though. Angela, were you happy with that draw against Wigan? Obviously, you must have hoped to win against one of the lower teams in the division at home. Uh, hi, Mark. Happy New Year to you. Thank and you very much. Even though you're from the dark side of the streets, I Port Vale, that. yeah. Port Vale fan, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stoke-on-Trent, born and bred. I always like to see Stoke doing well, though. Always. Uh, I know you can, Mark. In answer to the question, uh, I was quite happy that we got a point against Wigan because they are one of our, our bogey sides. It looked like we pinched it at the end, but I think the draw was a fair result on the day. Yeah. Um, How has Peter Crouch been doing for you? Uh, he's played remarkably well and, as you know, far better than myself. He's an excellent footballer. I think people expected him to 
uh, just beyond the end of the lumped up balls from Stoke. But he's, he's an incredibly good footballer and uh, he's been worth his weight in gold for Stoke this season. He's playing remarkably well for us. Do you think that getting into the Europa League was it kind of deterred from you having a good start to the season? You've picked up, obviously, uh, in, in the later months. Well, I mean, all the travelling Stoke had to do, and of course they were away after every uh, Europa League match, didn't help. And I think we did 12,000 miles in in our group, um, which was an awful lot. It, it did have um, an impact on our results. We lost four at Sunderland and five, dare I say, at Bolton. But we seem to have got over that now. We uh, we had a good win away at Everton to, to put that sort of myth to bed. And uh, in fact, I think playing in the Europa League has improved Stoke as a football club. And it's been a fantastic journey for the supporters. People like myself have, have gone away to places we'd never have gone to, and uh, we're enjoying it. Is Tony Pooley as loved as he should be in Stoke? Well, uh, there's about 3,000 Vale fans that can't stand him, but uh, the vast majority of the, uh, the Stoke fans love him. I, I think it's, you either love Tony, he's a bit like Marmite, you, you either love him or you hate him. I don't appreciate the way we play sometimes, but... Uh, as you know, it's all about getting results, Mark, and, and staying in the Premier League, and hopefully we'll do that again this season. OK, whilst we're um, loving this uh, potteries conversation, <laughs> we are going to move on to uh, events at the top of the table. And uh, Stupid footballers posted this on Twitter, reacting uh, to Sunday's football, saying Manchester City fans must be fuming over £400 million spent on players and they haven't won a game this year. Got to enjoy that, really, haven't we? <laughs> um, but, yeah, who do you think, Steve, have been the biggest losers in the last couple of days? Uh, I was hoping I wouldn't have to answer that question. Uh, I'd have to say it would be my team, Chelsea, because, uh, obviously, uh, the expectations for Torres were through the roof and he hasn't really uh, backed those up. Um, you know, Lampard hasn't been playing at all and he had that terrible pass that gave away that last goal. Um, and now we got Drogba leaving, you know, maybe for good. Um, it's really not looking up for the team and for AVB. Um, I mean, Abramovich said that he backs AVB, um, I don't know who in their right mind would want to believe every word of that, but um, I, I feel... It's really okay. important, this, this, this January transfer window, how much money AVB gets off Roman Abramovich, because it will tell you whether he's backing his manager to, to, the, to the hilt by saying, right, what do you need? And he needs players in every position. Players seem like they've been upset. Analka wasn't invited to the Christmas party. Uh, Alex wasn't invited either. They've had car park passes taken off them. It all seems very petty. You know, one thing you have to do, he's a young manager. He's only been in, in, the, in the game for two, year, two seasons. He's the second least experienced manager in the Premier League. I think Steve Keane is the, is the least expert, uh, just, just in front of him. So, you know, he's got a lot to learn, uh, AVB. And, I, and, and I've watched a lot of... Chelsea games because it's very close to where I live and I have to say he uses three substitutions every game in every every game he plays and he doesn't change the system and I just mm -hmm. think that he doesn't change the system he just changes the personnel and I think there's some big changes needed at Chelsea I don't think they'll finish in the top four mm -mm. no and I, I feel the same way um you know it wouldn't surprise me if he leaves before the end of the season but if Chelsea is not in the top four and by some miracle they win the Champions League, he's, he's definitely out. Well, I think winning the Champions League would definitely keep him his job. But um, for what I've seen of him, and he is young, he's still got a lot to learn ahead of him, but he's a talented coach that I think he needs to change his mentality in the Premier League. Well, yeah, AVB actually third favourite with one bookmaker as uh, the next manager to go. Chelsea booed off the pitch on Saturday. Uh, he was somewhat disappointed in his post-match interview yesterday, but uh, one man who was incredibly despondent today. It's very rare you see Roberto Mancini looking like this after a match. We miss uh, a big opportun opportunity today because uh, we had a big chance to go three points uh, up uh, to United. But now we should restart because we play in 48 hours and uh, we should have uh, good concentration for the next game.
well, obviously it's a manager who didn't expect to go away and lose. I think they lost last year in the last minute at Sunderland as well. You saw it, you saw them probably getting on 47 points ahead of Manchester United. Just not happy. Um, it was all about his team selection. And I'd have to say, though, Sunderland deserved something from the game. I thought they battled and chased and worked really hard and made it difficult for Manchester City. But Manchester City are a talented team. They've got the biggest squad in the Premier League and he, he chose the wrong side. Well, you mentioned that team selection. El Juve, Bright Afori has uh, talked about just that on Facebook, saying Mancini's the only one to be blamed for City's defeat at the Stadium of Light. How can he rest as many as six first team players simply because City play Liverpool on Tuesday. Well, another man who has been criticised about his team selection this weekend was Sir Alex Ferguson, a United, of course, beaten by Blackburn yesterday. This is what he had to say after the match. We didn't expect that. Um, the, the pitch was heavy, did suit our play. The second half, at least, we, we did something about the game and 2-2, I thought we'd, we'd go and win it. The third goal was a killer for us, you know, it was a bad defensive error. We should have done better with that. It was a very interesting Sir Alex Ferguson that. He blamed the pitch, he blamed injuries, he blamed a defensive issue, but he didn't go as far as blaming De Gea for that last goal. Mark, do you want to pick up on that? Oh, sorry, sorry, Amanda, yeah. Well, Lindegaard played in, in the game, I think it was at Fulham, where they won 5-0. Um, then they backed that up with another 5-0 win. And you're thinking, why is he going to change here? De Gea, as, I, as, as everyone knows, that I said, I don't think Manchester United can win the Champions League and can't win the Premier League with this goalkeeper. He just doesn't look good enough. Um, you know, he's back in the team. And I would say that, you know, there seems to be some fallout with, with Sir Alex Ferguson and Wayne Rooney and a couple of other players over this going for something to eat, players being out a, a night or so before the game. Um, Wayne Rooney was left out the side, didn't look very happy about it. And I don't think the fans will be happy either when the, the title race is so close, Amanda, with Manchester City, their arch rivals across the other end of the city, where they want points on the board and they, they hope Sir Alex Ferguson can sort this out. He's, he's had a, a spat with Wayne Rooney, as we know, months and months ago when he signed, and then he signed a new deal. So Wayne Rooney left out the team, players playing out of position. You know, Raphael was he playing central midfield um, with Park no creativity and Manchester United who you know we've, we've picked up on the goal scoring form of recent being beat by the bottom team at home is unacceptable yeah well, um what do you think of uh, events at Old Trafford do you think there's more to this Wayne Rooney spat with Sir Alex Ferguson than meets the eye please do get in touch with us uh, Twitter Facebook give us a call maybe all the usual ways available um, but it is incredible Manchester United uh, beaten and people are calling for Sir Alex Ferguson's head on his birthday as well, Firoz in Nairobi has posted this on our Facebook page. Congratulations to Sir Alex Ferguson on his 70th birthday and the tremendous success he's brought to Man U. However, I feel it's time he passed the baton to another person who can rebuild the team and prevent it sliding further down the European rankings. Steve, would you want to see uh, Sir Alex Ferguson go? Of course I would. But, uh, is that... <laughs> That's all you need to say, really, isn't it? That's right. But is that going to happen? No. I mean, why would they get rid of him? You know, he just won the title for them last season. Um, I mean, well, of course. You know, that would be my uh, dream come true to see him go. But, uh, no, I mean, he has the team. He has the players. Um, no, it was just one bad loss. You know, it happens. But, uh, you know, one thing that you pointed out uh, was who he was blaming. And, you know, it seems that uh, Fergie does that a lot. He likes to blame other people, but never really himself or admit the fact that he just played a better team, which, you know, a lot of the time happens. But uh, in the end, no, he's staying. I, I think, Steve, I think when, Steve you, when you're the manager of Manchester United, you, ex you, you, you set a certain standard what's... Everyone needs to adhere to it. That football club, Manchester United, shouldn't be being beaten by Blackburn Rovers. You're quite right. He shouldn't be blaming the pitch, etc., because he's got a squad what's good, good enough to 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 do to beat Blackburn. But you know, I just think most managers protect the players, don't they? They sort of like blame the referee, bad decision, shouldn't have been a penalty or a free kick. When really he gets in the changing room, and you can you know from experience and former players that they'll get hell in that changing room because it's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so Nandas right. Mukash has uh, posted on Facebook saying Sir Alex is still a great manager. United are just in a transition phase and maybe youngsters like De Gea aren't just ready yet. Um, let's bring in uh, Tarek. Welcome you to the conversation. A Newcastle fan who joins us from uh, Cairo. What, what do you make of what you've seen over the last few days? Well, obviously, as a Newcastle fan, we had high hopes going into the Liverpool game. Even though our record there is not a very good one, I think it's been like seven or eight seasons since we last scored a goal at Anfield. But it was, it was a bit of a disappointing result. But I mean, in terms of the top of the table, it's been quite a strange week, you know, with Chelsea, Man City, and Man United losing. And I think Arsenal are the big winners of this week. Van Persie didn't get the record, obviously. Shearer still holds that record. But I think it's opened the title race up a bit. I think Tottenham could, could be pushing for second or first place, but I think it'll still probably be the two Manchester teams. And I think people calling for, for Sir Alex's, um, to, to resign at this point, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, how many times have, have you know, people written Manchester United off under Sir Alex and they, they've proved them wrong? I mean, at the end of the day, they're only one point behind City and it's only halfway through the season. So I think I wouldn't be surprised if they lifted the title again this season. I think you'll find the good news for Manchester United fans is they're actually now level on points, 45 points oh, sorry, apiece yeah, after 19 games. Don't you worry, but I'm here sitting proudly wearing my red shirt regardless of what's happened uh, <laughs> over the last couple of days. Shameful. Uh, <laughs> Shameful. Anyway, we're going to be talking about Arsenal and Thierry Henry and who you want to see your club sign over the next month or so in the transfer window in just a couple of minutes. Please do get in touch with us, maybe using the hashtag SWHYS. Don't go anywhere. Okay, you're watching Sports World Have Your Say here on uh, BBC World News with me, Amanda Davis. I'm joined in the studio this week by Mark Bright and what has been quite a sensational Christmas period uh, and New Year period. Both Manchester United and Manchester City and Chelsea all being beaten in the last couple of days. Odds of an incredible 2,365 for one uh, for that happening at the start of the weekend. Um, Mark, so if we have a look at the table now, uh, Manchester United and Manchester City there on mm. 45 points apiece. Tarek there saying uh, Arsenal the big winners in the last couple of days. What do you think about how things stand now? Well, Manchester City nearly had the perfect Christmas. Excuse me, Manchester United nearly had the perfect Christmas, didn't they? So going into that last game against Blackburn, they were nine points from the from the three games and it, you you'd think playing obviously Blackburn they would definitely win but they didn't you know Arsenal have maintained that they've had a terrible start to the season and then they've slowly slowly got the players into the Arsenal way the system um, they've, they've got some settled um, um, sides they've produced some really good results um, they've climbed up the table I'd have to say though Chelsea, for me, I saw them against Aston Villa, never deserved to win. Aston Villa played absolutely fantastic. Steven Ireland was brilliant. And a lot of Villa fans who haven't been happy with Alex McLeish, I think you should just give him a chance. Darren Bent was on the bench, came off the bench, and he scored a goal, and that topped them off. And I have to say that, though, that I was a little bit surprised at Spurs because Sir Alex Ferguson said they were playing the best football in the Premier League. And, and you know, I just thought that they would take advantage um, going into this Christmas period. And they've just remained in the, in the top three. Yeah, you are watching Sports World Have Your Say here on BBC World News. We will be back with more discussion on the English Premier League in just a couple of minutes. You're watching Sports World Have Your Say on this New Year's Day. We're talking about uh, what has been called the, the silly season uh, in the English Premier League after a quite sensational run of results. We've been looking at the table. Liverpool now in sixth um, and may well have been distracted from today's uh, events by the 115-page judgment from the FA Commission about the reasons behind finding Luis Suarez guilty of racial abuse towards Patrice Evra. They say the Liverpool striker's evidence was, quote, unreliable in matters of critical importance and inconsistent. He has, of course, been banned for eight games for those results. I've got uh, Mark Bright with me in the studio. We've also got uh, Angela with us, who's a Stoke fan, and Tarek. Um, Tarek, what do you think are Liverpool's next move, having seen those reports? Uh, we've only just got through it. I don't know whether you've had a chance to get through the 115 pages. 
Well, I read um, briefly the summary of, of the BB, of um, sorry the FA's um, ruling, and I think I think it's, it could be a case of lost in translation, as they say. I mean, he's a foreign player; he's never played in the Premier League before. He doesn't maybe know how things work over. I mean, he's come from Holland, which where they have a lot of you know minority ethnic minority players. But I think it's a, it's a completely different culture over here in England. Things that maybe are acceptable at home in Uruguay or in the continent are not acceptable in the UK. So I think he's learned that the hard way, basically. Angela, do you think Liverpool have a leg to stand on in terms of an appeal now? I think Liverpool probably will. Um, will I think the lawyers will find some basis on which to appeal. But whether they appeal or not, it would appear the FA um, had a good look at all the information. They had some body language experts in as well. It's not just been one man's word against another. And as Mark Bright will tell you, they've been subjected himself, unfortunately, that racism is just not acceptable. In, in, in any part of society, let alone football. And I think it's really good that uh, our associations are taking that stance. Yeah, I, I'd like to just say that, Angela. Uh, obviously, this has been a, a test case for, for uh, the English Premier League. And what they're saying is Suarez has tarnished the, the English Premier League reputation all around the world. <clears throat> Both men were interviewed along with several players and, and, um, and they had lip readers looking at all the evidence. And Liverpool have sort of like 13 days or something to respond to this. Now, I, I just think that th there comes a time when you just say, do you know what, a mistake has been made. He didn't, it wasn't intended um, to be, uh, come out how he said it. And he's going to hold his hands up, accept the punishment, accept the fine and try and move forward. But what happened is you got the, the, the Liverpool Football Club had all the players wearing all these T-shirts saying, we support Suarez, we support Suarez. Now, there's nothing wrong in supporting your teammates. Your teammate's been found guilty and is wrong. They're, they have to draw a line there. I think Liverpool Football Club were wrong to do what they did. And I think the players, I think they were pressured probably into wearing the T-shirts. It was an awkward situation, I think, for a black player like Glenn Johnson, who's got a teammate who's been charged and found guilty of, uh, of, of racial comments to a, an opponent. And then to be wearing the T-shirt as if to say, well, it doesn't really matter what he says. He's my teammate and I'm going to back him. I think that was wrong. And I think Liverpool Football Club here, they're, they're entitled to their response, and I think they will do. I think they'll try and get the sentence less uh, than eight games because they feel that's a long period. If you look at some of the evidence and the summary, as, as we were just talking about now, there's just so much evidence in there which, we, you know, he said it seven times, and he didn't say it in a friendly way. That, you know, if you're having an argument with somebody, you're not saying that in an endearing way, then all of a sudden you're trying to pinch somebody... Um, Listen, the, the, the 115 pages, I haven't been through it. I've just had a, a flick through some of the stuff on the internet. But I just think it's time that, that Liverpool should just say, do you know what, it wasn't intended. He's, he wants to move forward. He's apologising to everybody and go from there. But it'll be very interesting to see if they do appeal. Because if they do appeal and, they, and they're not successful in their appeal, his ban could go from eight to ten games. Yeah, Mark, that's actually the point that uh, Matthew's been uh, making on our Facebook site, facebook.com forward slash sports world, have your say. He says it's not a question of whether he's racist. The question is, did he use racist language, which he admitted to? So end of. Liverpool should have condemned him straight away by wearing the shirts. They basically said Liverpool FC gives racism the thumbs up. Um, Steve, whatever way you look at it, though, eight games plus the added one game ban for the gesture to Fulham fans, Suarez is going to be a big, big loss, isn't he, to Liverpool? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's just complete stupidity and selfishness when you do that because you don't only hurt yourself, but when you're such a, a vital part of your team, you hurt your entire team. And then that hurts the fans and it hurts the city. And then it, that hurts... Steve, yeah, 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 Suarez yeah, yeah. is uh, Liverpool's top goal scorer so far this season. Do you think Liverpool need to be bringing in a player to replace him in the transfer window? That's what we're going to be talking about in just a couple of minutes here on Sports World. Have your say. Please don't go anywhere.
Hello, welcome to Sports World Have Your Say with me, Amanda Davis. This week I'm joined by Mark Bright and for this first show of 2012, some of our biggest fans of the season so far as well. We've been talking this silly season after a quite incredible set of results this weekend. You'd be forgiven for thinking your TV set had been broken after defeats for Manchester City, United and Chelsea. But is this what makes the EPL the best league in the world? Please do get in touch all the usual ways here. Let us know too who you want to to see at your club as the transfer window opens. That's what we're going to be talking about in the next half an hour or so, but let's just pause to get a summary of the latest news. If you're watching Sports World, have your say. We're going to be talking the uh, opening of the transfer window in just a couple of minutes. Please do get in touch, but I'm joined by uh, Mark Bright in the studio this week. Uh, Tarek, a Newcastle fan from Cairo, is with us, as is uh, Mariam, who's a Barcelona fan in Prague, and Uche is a Liverpool fan who joins us from Nigeria. But before we move on, we're just going to uh, revisit the... Um, Luis Suarez uh, debate after the releasing of the 115 page report from the uh, FA disciplinary committee as to why they have uh, banned him for eight games from um, his racist abuse towards Patrice Evra. Mark, we've been talking about Liverpool's statement to come out as a squad wearing t-shirts in support of their mm. player. What do you make of that? And I suppose the question to a former pro is, would you have been happy wearing one of those T-shirts yourself? Amanda, it's easy in hindsight to say that, you know, I wouldn't have done this or I would have done that. But I can tell you as a player now, I would have been uncomfortable. I'd have been uncomfortable as, as like um, Glenn Johnson, the, you know, on Twitter he said that I will support who I want, when I want. And he's my teammate and I've got my reasons. Now, his teammate's done wrong. His teammate got found guilty and, and has been punished. They, we're waiting to see if Liverpool will appeal, but I think it was wrong. I think Liverpool got a fantastic history, you know, one of the most successful clubs in this, in, in, in our country. And I just think that they've been, I think they've let themselves down a little bit. I think that um, a lot of the fans I've watched on Twitter and there have been lots of debating things that admitted that he's done something wrong and Suarez needs to be punished. What Liverpool's saying is that they're above that, you know, that regardless of this has been lost in translation, I don't think it's been lost in translation at all. I just think that they've had an independent inquiry look at it. They've had lip readers looking at the evidence. Uh, other players have given evidence, and is is it's just it's been unreliable. That's uh, that's what that's the verdict of uh, Suarez's uh, appeal, or well, he's, he's sort of um, all the information he's given. So. I, I would I don't I would not have worn that T-shirt. I would have felt uncomfortable. I would have said to the manager, do you know what? I, I, I'd rather not wear this T-shirt and make a statement, you know, because and the manager might have said, well, if you don't wear it, then that's going to make a bigger statement that you're standing up. I'd just say that for myself personally, on this occasion, with this the seriousness of this, the kick races about a football campaign, we've been running this country for about three decades. I'm not wearing the T-shirt now. Whether the manager then would have obviously said, right, if one person's not wearing them, we all don't wear them. You know, I think I'm all for standing up for your team when you think he's been wronged. But on this occasion, he's been found guilty. He's wrong, and I think they think they were, they were wrong to wear the T-shirts. Uche, have you felt uncomfortable? Do you feel your team has let football down? Well, in, indeed, I, um, you know, racism is not to be tolerated anywhere, not in football, not in any sport, not in our society. Uh, so, so anybody who sides, um, anyone who's been found guilty of, of, of racist behavior just because you're a fan is, is wrong, okay? Racism is wrong. And, and so regardless of, of, of who is involved, we must um, speak up against it and we must reject it in all its forms. So I would have felt uncomfortable with wearing a T-shirt um, to, to show solidarity with, with Suarez, uh, given that he's been found guilty of, of, of racism. So, so, so it, it, it's unconscionable in any sport to, to, to resort to racism. Mariam, can I ask you, obviously you're a Barcelona fan, do you think he has a defence when he says that uh, Suarez, it's lost in translation. Um, well, I'm not a speaker of Spanish, unfortunately, but um, uh, I do know that the term uh, that he used against Evra is is used. Um, it doesn't have to be in particularly in an affectionate way, but it is used almost without thinking in in this country, in uh, uh, back where he comes from, in Uruguay. Um, 
so that is basically what what he used as his defense. Um, it it is true, as in it is a term that is used not only affectionately, sometimes uh, in a way to to just talk to the person, uh, but. Um, this is England. It's not used like that um, in England, therefore. And and Mariam you know. and Mariam, Suarez's mannerisms when delivering these words were not those mannerisms of somebody wishing somebody well. Exactly, exactly. I mean, um, the defence he is using is uh, true, is a fact, and this term is used like that in Uruguay. But it's you can't. Mm, I don't know how to express this with, uh, since I'm not a fluent Spanish speaker myself, but... Um, Uche, uh, Uche let me bring you in. You certainly <laughs> looked uh, aggrieved at the idea uh, that it got lost in translation. Um, well, I, I don't know. People can, can get into a debate about um, semantics, you know, but um, uh, like we have pointed out, the body language accompanying the expression um, conveyed the intended sense of the of, of the communication. So, so I think it's it's with hindsight that he's he is trying. Oh, I think we well, Amanda. I think if you look at Liverpool's perspective, they're, they're trying to break into the top four, and you're thinking that um, Suarez is their leading goal scorer. Andy Carroll, he hasn't been successful so far. So what they're going to do? They're going to lose somebody for eight games. That's going to have a massive effect on the team the morale at the football club, the fans. And so you, what, you, what uh, Kenny Dalglish needs is for Andy Carroll to, to produce some goals and give the team a lift. Now, I think Liverpool are trying the be will, will try their best to get um, the, the, the sentence reduced from eight games, maybe to five or to four. Um, and, and I think that in the best interest of football or for Liverpool Football Club, they would like Suarez on the pitch. But in the interest of, of, of the, the, the racism campaign that he's been punished and the, 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 the sentence should stand... Well, uh, let's talk uh, the transfer window then. Andy Carroll doesn't seem to be uh, doing the job. Quite a few clubs seem to be in the hunt for strikers. Uh, let's bring in uh, Beth, who's a, a Chelsea fan in Texas. Uh, do you think that was a, a farewell from Didier Drogba yesterday? Um, I think it was more of a nod to Ozzy. Uh, um, Peter Osgood's buried on the penalty spot and... Um, it was the record that he came um, and equaled, and I think it was an honourable thing for him to do. We were um, a lot of us said no. It was, it was uh, Didier, you know, bowing his his head to and saluting Peter Osgood. So, what do you think is going to be happening at Stamford Bridge in the next month or so? Uh, Gary Cahill seems to be confirmed, barring a few uh, details. But what else? Um, from what I've heard, a big detail, which is his personal terms, <laughs> but, you know, you're asking the wrong person, really, because if I had my way, I wouldn't do anything in the transfer window except for bring up our boys from the reserves. I've, I've watched a lot of Chelsea, and um, as I said before, Andre Villas-Boas makes three substitutions every game, but doesn't change the pattern of play. He just changes the personnel. So do you, it looks like Josh McCracken as well, a really talented young player, is going to go out on loan. Is he going to Wolves, I think? So it doesn't look like he's going to bring any young players through. If, if anything, you guys experience, the, the, the club have always bought experienced international footballers. Is that what you think Andrew Villas-Boas is going to do in January? Well, I keep hoping that what Roman said five years ago or whatever it was that he was and the money that he spent on Cobham and, you know, working on the academy squad and everything actually comes to fruition. We've got some some really great players out on loan um, playing in the reserves. Um, Sam Hutchinson just made a miraculous recovery from a career ending injury. He was on the bench yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, I always have my fingers crossed. I I. I pray for our young boys to get a chance and to stop spending silly money and, you know, and any transfers. Well, he did say that the club would have to be self-sufficient, so. didn't he, in sort of like five or six years. But when you invest in your youth system, have they done, have they, have they have done, you expect to see players come through. They've started to come through at clubs like Liverpool. You know, they do it at Arsenal all the time. Look at Everton. Yes. You know, yeah. I mean, I... I I have a lot of respect for David Moyes that he sticks to that program. Um, I have a lot of respect for Everton Football Club because they stick to that program. Um, we used to have it long ago. Um, and I just, 
I just, I, it's it's my preference. Like I said, I'm I'm really not interested in the transfer window. It never seems to work out. I, you know, we got uh, two players last uh, January, both Torres and David Luis. Um, David has done. He's at least entertaining. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very well put. Uh, another another young player. And, uh, talk I like him a lot, but I like players that are there. To play, I go to Chelsea because my heart lives there. I I like players that play because their heart is there, not for the money. Yeah, talk of uh, Josh McKecker and going out on loan as well. Talking of another young uh, Chelsea player, he has to play. I mean, I mean, I'm hoping he goes to Swansea with Brendan because Brendan knows him quite well. Yeah. Um, it breaks my heart to see Josh go on loan. But if he needs that for half a season to get back fit to where he was a year and a half ago when he was playing a lot, then only only his his manager um, Dermot Drummy and and the rest of the Chelsea staff understand that. Maybe it's a situation where he can come back just like you know yeah, Daniel, um, Sturridge. Daniel Sturridge did. Absolutely, yeah. And JT for that matter. Yes, it's, it, I think it's always good, Amanda, for the players to go out and on loan through. For, you know, from, from sort of like 20 years now, players have been going out on loan and coming back. They go out on, on loan as, as boys and come back men. They know what it's like to play in the first team and how important it is. The emphasis on, you know, the team play and structure. They learn all that, not in the reserves, in the first team. And it's always good. And, I, you know, I, I, I endorse it. I mean, when I was at Charlton, Scott Parker went out on loan. I think Paul Koncheski went out on loan. They come back better players for it. Uh, Brighty, one man who uh, left the English Premier League as a man has come back... An older man, that is, of course, Thierry Henry. Uh, mm -hmm. News, he's going back to Arsenal. And uh, OEM DVD Oquera has said on Facebook, all top six lost confidence when they heard our icon Henri was putting <laughs> pen to paper. What a blessed 2012. We're going to be talking comebacks and, of course, uh, more on the transfer window in just a couple of minutes here on Sports World. Have your say. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Okay, all right. Hi, you're watching Sports World Have Your Say. Lots of you have been getting in touch with us. Uh, Suarez's ban is very harsh, maybe three or four games, but not eight. 
says uh, Alan, who is a, a Liverpool fan from Singapore. Uh, another comment here, we should offload Andy Carroll. He's lazy and doesn't put in much effort. He's been poor and should go. We should replace him with uh, Lucas Podolski. That's Massa from uh, Sierra Leone. Um, well, let me put that to um, Uche, who joins us from uh, Nigeria. Um, Uche, Luis Suarez might well be out for almost, well, I think over half of uh, Liverpool's remaining games. How do you solve the problem of losing him? Um, well... The, the, the heartening thing about um, what's happening at the moment is that um, Captain Gerrard is back. And, and with every game that he plays, he is coming back to his real form. Um, and and I, I think that that's, that's if, if he is able to handle, you know, the midfield as masterfully as he is capable of, uh, he can bring the best out of Andy Carroll. I, I, I think Andy Carroll is, is, is a fantastic player, as a matter of fact. But he, he needs. Um... Oh, I think we've lost Uche again. Uh, Gerard back, of course, and not only helps Andy Carroll, but scored one himself on uh, Friday night. Mark uh, Tarek is a, a Newcastle fan who's uh, with us as well. Uh, lots of clubs wanting strikers. We're talking about uh, Denver Bar, one of the best uh, deals in the last transfer window. I mean, we, I was kind of ex not expecting obviously him to score this many goals, but I mean, last season he was on loan at West Ham, second half, and I think he scored something like eight goals in 11 games, which was pretty impressive in the Premier League. He started this season, you know, Leon Best scored a couple early on, but Denver Bar really took centre stage since then, and he's, he's, he's been out amazing for us. I mean, we got him on a free as well. I mean, apparently Stoke rejected him because of concerns about his, his fitness. So I'm just praying that, you know, that we don't lose him in January because he's, he's a vital player for us, and we need to keep hold of him, you know, to, to, to make any progress this season. You know, Alan, Alan Pardew obviously sold Andy Carroll in the last transfer window. And when I spoke to him, he, he said it, it happened so late when he moved for other players, no one wanted to release the players. So, you know, um, I can't remember who he signed. He signed someone on a short term deal. But he said he said it really took them by surprise. Usually you, managers get wind of this sort of thing. But, you know, I don't think he could I don't think he could envisage Denver Bar. I think he's the second leading goal scorer in the Premier League, isn't he? With 14 goals being that successful. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, we, like I said, I mean, like you said, yeah, he, he didn't have any much say in this time. I mean, I, I think until a couple of days before he was sold, he insisted that Andy Carl wasn't going anywhere. So I think it's, it's Mike Ashley who calls the shots when it comes to transfers. And we've got a couple of players who have, who are, you know, the big clubs are looking at, you know, um, Denver Bar and Czech Teote. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, they're going off to the African Cup of Nations as well. So, I mean, it, it's worrying. The, I, I, the sooner January finishes, I think, the better for us as a Newcastle team. Have you got, have you got the cover, though, for Denver Bar when, once he leaves? I don't think we have. I mean, Leon Best scored a few goals early on, but he's been, you know, firing blanks lately. He puts in a lot of effort. He puts himself around. I think he's a handful for defences, but he hasn't got the finishing ability of Denver Bar. And we've got Peter Lovenkrantz as well, who as well isn't quite up there with Denver Bar. So I think, I mean, um, Alan Pardew recently said that he wouldn't be getting a striker in January, which I think is worrying, because I think we need backup to Denver Bar. I, mean, I think he's as important to us as, as Van Persie said to, to Arsenal. You know, he's our main man at the moment. We're relying on heavily. For scoring didn't goals. didn't a, a, a deal fall through recently? Was it a French player? Yeah, I think it was, I don't think he was, from Lille. I think it was. I think there was concerns over his fitness that fell through. I think his name was, I can't remember his name to be honest, but I think it was very close to being finished. And then his um, because of his fitness. And then after that, Alan Pardew said that we won't be going for a striker. Defence was his main concern. So um, I think Chris Samba was being rumoured to be joining us, one of, the, one of the options we've had. But I think, you know, I think we definitely need a striker in January, especially since we're going to lose Bar for at least four weeks to, the, a, to the African Cup of Nations. It was a great start to the season from, from Newcastle, wasn't it? I think it took everybody by surprise. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was, it was, we, everybody was surprised. I mean, we knew it wasn't going to last. I mean, I think people were talking <laughs> about top four in Pardew for England, but I think that was never realistic. I mean... Talk to any Newcastle fan. I think a top ten or a top eight finish will be will be great for us. I mean, until we start spending a bit more money, I don't think we'll break into the top six. I mean, Mike Ashley, he's, he hasn't spent much of the Andy Carroll money, and I think people are worried that we'll be selling players more than we're buying players. So I think you know, top ten, top eight will be great for us. Realistic. Well, a, a player who uh, it looks like has moved, of course, is uh, Thierry Henry. Uh, a good decision to go back, Mark. Do you think? Um, do you know what? I'd, I was up there for the um, for the unveiling of the statues and. You know, it was such a proud moment for him. You know, he, he broke down doing his speech, said how proud he was to play for the club. And I don't think in the short period of time he's coming back, he can damage his image. 
I mean, um, he's a legend with the club. He's 34 years old now. He's had a good season with the New York Red Bulls. I think if he comes back and does an impact play, plays for an hour, comes off the bench to play for half a game, um, and I think that what Arsene Wenger wants can't, can't get through to the fans or to the, maybe the members of the board, that the influence that he can have on the training ground with the younger players. We know that, you know, Oxley chamberlain has moved there. I think he's really talented. He could learn a lot of Henri. You know, so can Theo Walcott, who idolises him. And if he scores a few goals, remember a few seasons ago, it was uh, Henrik Larsson went back to, went to Manchester United and he really enjoyed his time there and had a great spell. So I, I think it's a plus for Arsenal. I don't think they can lose. Um, he's, keep, he's staying fit. He's obviously, his fitness levels are very high. Uh, because he's been training with Arsenal for several weeks. So I think, it, you know, it's a win-win. You come on, the crowd go absolutely mad because he's a legend at the club. Um, and, and if he plays for half an hour, an hour, that, it's a success thing. Man, yeah, man Char for me. Charles on Facebook says, a sensational return of the legendary record-breaking Arsenal top goal poacher of all time will boost the confidence levels in the Arsenal camp. There, That's picking up on that point you made there. But... Mahame Lumbani's concern, he's written on our Facebook page as well. Even Redknapp of Spurs has said Henri is amongst the best. Uh, the only worry I have now is will Le Prof, Wenger of course, uh, sign someone to the fans' expectation? He obviously uh, doesn't see Henri as the answer to the problem. Mariam, uh, do you want to see any uh, players back in La Liga who've uh, come to the um, EPL? Oh, well... Um... We can even speak on terms of Thierry Henry. He was in Barcelona as well, and I absolutely idolized him. And uh, so I would love for him to come back to Barcelona. Just, just in terms of um, um, just having him wear the shirt again. And uh, the Barcelona fans also, they adore him. And um, sure, we're not uh, that lacking in, uh, in the forwards department, but he, I would love to have him back personally, but that's just a really selfish opinion, to be honest. <laughs> oh, I think... Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, Ma Amanda, hello? do you know there's a player who's doing uh, really... Ma the player, Amanda, player who's doing, <laughs> Amanda, there's a player who's doing really well. Huntelaar, I think he's at Schalke now. Now, if people... We're saying where are all the strikers coming from? Everyone's looking for a good striker. You know, Huntelaar has is, is got some like 21 goals in 25 games for Schalke. And if managers are looking around and they have money to spend, then I'm sure that, you know, maybe Harry Redknapp might have a, a few quid to, to bring somebody in this transfer window because I think Pavlichenko looks like he'd be going. So, yeah, I think it'd be a good move. Well, one player who's uh, said today on Sunday that he's uh, pretty glad he's out of it all and doesn't want to come back is uh, Gary Neville. He's been writing in the, the UK's Mail on Sunday newspaper and said he reckons it's uh, possibly the best ever season in the Premier League. He says never before have so many points been accumulated by the top six teams at this stage of the season. Only the year in which Chelsea won the league in 2005 comes close. Beth, how does it rate to you as a season? season <laughs> um you know yeah everybody has their downs it's been amazing teams that shouldn't win win teams that shouldn't lose lose draws all over the place um i you know i think that's why i that's one of the things i love about the epl is it truly is that um that reality that any team can beat any other team on any given day Mariam, Mariam, what's it, how do you think um, the pre English Premier League compares to La Liga? Oh, um, well, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of comparing the two leagues because I think they're quite different. Uh, the, the myth, like not the myth, the fact about the English uh, Premier League being more physical is quite true. It's much more full on. Um, and, the, and the Spanish La Liga is um, much more technical and... Um, but uh, I love both. Uh, I'm a bit more close at heart with the English Premier League because I speak fluent English, so I can uh, well, get in touch I think, with I think in all Messi around. and Ronaldo, you have the two best players in the world there. OK, um, true. Uh, Mark, true. quickly, before we go, uh, champions. Champions, Manchester City. Uh, bottom. Bottom, um, Bolton. Mariam, champions. Uh, I would say Manchester United. Bottom. Uh, Bolton And Beth, well. champions. <laughs> Reality says Man City, my heart says Chelsea, bottom Bolton. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much for everybody getting in touch. A great start to 2012. We look forward to doing it all again. Same time, same place next week. Goodbye.